If you've been following modern entrepreneurship, tech, and business culture, you've probably heard of Summit. Summit started with an idea. Great things happen when you bring people together and get them talking. That's not a new idea. It's why global movers and shakers head to places like Davos and Aspen after all. But the guests at those kinds of events are typically already established. They're presidents and Pulitzer Prize winners, or the CEOs and CFOs of giant corporations. What about the next generation, though? The people building the apps and startups set to revolutionize tomorrow's world. What if you brought them together and got them talking? In 2008, four 20-something entrepreneurs with little hands-on experience and just two college degrees between them decided to find out. Their book, Make No Small Plans, is the story of what happened next. The short version is that they built Summit, an event company which has been known as a kind of Davos for young entrepreneurs and a hothouse for up-and-coming talent. Summit's first iteration, a sky trip in Utah, was a far cry from the kind of events it hosts today. Back then, There were just 19 guests in a pokey rented house with shared bedrooms. The beer ran out within half an hour, and the shoestring budget barely covered the skiing equipment. But it didn't matter. Once those guests got to talking, sparks started flying. They traded ideas, hatched deals, and made plans for the future. Most importantly, they forged lifelong friendships. And after Utah... Summit snowballed. Today, it hosts events all over the world, and its list of guest speakers includes the likes of Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Al Gore, and many other recognizable names. The scale of the Summit operation may have changed, but the company's values remain the same. The Founders Manifesto puts it really simply. We believe that the more great people you meet, the more great people you will meet. My name is Inez, and in this Blink, I'm going to be learning about the story and the spirit of Summit right alongside you. We're not going to even try to tell you the long version. That's best left to the authors of Make No Small Plans. Instead, we'll be zooming in and focusing on five snapshots that capture the philosophy, ideas, and values of these remarkable entrepreneurs. First up, We're going to turn common knowledge on its head. People say, do something you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. It's an idea that's been knocking around so long, it's virtually become conventional wisdom. Thing is, though, it's not always right. The thinking here is that the things you care about, call them passions or hobbies, are easy because you want to do them. Work, by contrast, is a chore. A slog, something you have to do, which you'd rather not. Time flies when you're having fun, but the office clock turns unbearably slowly. If doing something you loved also earned you money, it wouldn't really be work. But there's another way of looking at things. The thing about passion projects is that they make you want to keep going deeper. You keep discovering more complexity more room for improvement. You also become more critical and more attuned to shortcomings. In short, passion projects turn you into a perfectionist. It's the same whatever the activity. Tennis, playing the guitar, writing code. You want to get better, but improvement is painful. Playing scales a thousand times sucks. Spending hours practicing your backhand is a chore. Building the 100th basic website is boring. But you persevere. You put in the hard yards, complete the drills. And it's precisely because you care that you're capable of doing the work. Put differently, if we turn that saying around, if you do something you love, you'll work every single day of your life. And that's a good thing because you'll be doing something that matters that expresses your values, that moves you towards your authentic goals. It's not a question of work versus passion, then. That's a false dichotomy. It's care 
and it's interest. If you care, you'll do the work. If it connects with who you are, if it interests you, the hard and boring parts of the process mean something. That's what sees you through. That's what keeps you pushing. And this idea isn't neatly packaged in Make No Small Plans. It isn't even given a chapter or section of its own. But it shines through on every page and in every story the authors tell. Of course, on its own, that care isn't enough for success. There's so much more that goes into something as complex and big as building a global company. But it's absolutely foundational. All the other stuff, that gets built on top of this commitment. For the next idea, let's rewind back to 2008. If you don't remember, the economy is crashing and the future is uncertain. Elliot, one of Summit's founders, is in college. He's not happy, though. Something is missing. One day, while walking to campus, he finds himself caught up in a large crowd of students. Everyone is streaming in the same direction towards the library to read the same textbooks and study the same problems. Problems last year's students solved. All so they can compete for the same jobs in the same labor market that's being wrecked by the greatest recession since the 30s. For Elliot, that doesn't really add up. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to work on his own problems, not his professors. He doesn't want to study. He wants to build something. In short, he's just discovered something important about himself a sense of where his authentic interests lie and what he wants to do with his life. The word authenticity can sound like a big and intimidating existential kind of thing. And that's because we often think of it in all or nothing terms, being authentic or being inauthentic. But you don't have to go all in right away. Take it from Elliot, who we're coming back to. Okay. So he's realized he wants to set and solve his own problems, to work for himself, to be an entrepreneur. His first thought? Take the plunge. Quit college, put everything on black. His dad, luckily, is a sensible guy. He's down to earth, he's practical, and here's what he says. There are risks, and then there are risks. The question to think about is how far you can fall. Dropping out of college and spending all your savings, it's very risky. If things don't pan out, you'll be in a tough situation that's hard to get out of. So what if you spend some of your savings and stay in college while working on what you really care about? If it doesn't work out, you'll have a bruised ego, but you'll still have options and half of your savings. Same reward, different risks. Simply put, don't put all your eggs in one basket. What was Elliot's response? He listened. He didn't drop out of college. He started selling ads in an online newsletter in his spare time. He didn't spend all his savings. And he didn't try to persuade his family to remortgage the house to support his business idea. And that, too, is part of the summit story. It was the cold calls he placed from his college dorm room which taught him the skills he'd need to launch the company. So here's the lesson. Acting authentically doesn't have to mean being reckless. You're not charging headlong into the unknown. You're slowly pushing open doors to new opportunities. The process begins with a single question. What am I interested in? Sometimes, that answer will present itself serendipitously. It just hits you one day, like it did Elliot. But you can also be more deliberate about it. Sit with that question a while, and then write your answers down. Maybe it's cooking, or fitness, or finance, or learning a new language. And then, we make time to do those things. Start cooking, take that class, get that certificate, enroll in that course. So many big journeys start with this shift from a passive wish to active engagement. But remember, it's not all or nothing. You don't have to make small plans, but you can start small. Let's not let the next idea break your heart. Turns out, entrepreneurship isn't glamorous. 
especially when you're cold calling prospective clients from your childhood bedroom. Most of all, it can be lonely. There were tons of other young entrepreneurs out there, but Summit's future founders found it hard to connect with them. Back in the late 2000s, the only real bet was to attend networking events. And these events were brutal. For a couple of hours, you'd be crammed into a brightly lit lobby of a downtown hotel with hundreds of people desperate to seize this opportunity to make connections. It was loud. It was stuffy. It was chaotic. It wasn't a get-together. It was a cattle market. And it wasn't just that there wasn't time or space for interesting conversations. These events seemed to actively encourage soul-crushing interactions. It was an environment designed for that guy who was always selling something, always pushing his agenda. The guy who's already surveying the room for his next target while failing to listen to the person in front of him. The guy who treats others as a means to his ends. Everything felt transactional and rooted in short-term thinking. It was about what you can do for me right now or tomorrow or next week. But the best networkers are the kind of people who build long-term relationships with people they care about. They understand that relationships need to be nurtured. You have to put work and practice and time into them before they bear fruit. For the Summit founders, this way of looking at things seemed intuitive, even obvious. But that posed an interesting question. If the secret to building great business relationships was hardly a mystery, why wasn't there some kind of forum that encouraged that behavior? A space in which better, deeper, more interesting conversations could be held. A place in which entrepreneurs could actually meet each other. It was that question which launched Summit Series. And the timing was right, too. The first buds of the new digital economy were sprouting from the rubble left behind by the crash of 2008. With the App Store, you could build anything. New brands were springing up and reimagining the way everything was sold, from mattresses to shoes to vacuum cleaners. But all these entrepreneurs were like individual little islands. Together, they formed a kind of archipelago, but there was no bridge connecting them. And that's where Summit could come in. Here was the idea. Bring as many of these entrepreneurs as possible together in one place and get them talking. Not just for a few hours and not in a stuffy hotel lobby. Somewhere nice. Somewhere where real conversations could unfold. And that's how it started. Elliot booked a house near Utah's ski slopes and started cold calling potential sponsors and interesting young entrepreneurs he'd read about. In the end, 19 people agreed to come on an all-expenses three-day ski trip. It was the start of something big, and none of it would have happened if Elliot hadn't taken the time to question the status quo. Okay. So we've talked a bit about following your passions, balancing your authenticity with good sense and starting small, being brave enough to break tradition and do things your way. What's next? For Summit's founders, whether you're hosting an event with fewer than 20 or more than 2,000 guests, certain rules always apply. First, the guests. Who do you invite? The summit take is that status is irrelevant. You don't have to be wealthy or occupy a prestigious position to be an interesting person. What really matters is that passion. You start by asking, is this person doing work they love? And the second question is even simpler. Are they nice? That's it. If someone ticks both those boxes, they pass what's known as the airport test. Basically, there's someone you'd happily spend four hours with if your flight got delayed. Those were the questions Summit's founders asked when they organized that ski trip to Utah. And they're questions that they still ask when they send out invites today. But interesting and nice guests alone don't make an event. There's another factor in play. One evening, this was around 2010, the founders were having dinner with an eccentric chef in Los Angeles. He had pioneered the city's pop-up restaurant scene and was the star of its underground food movement. 
His stunts included organizing dinners by the side of highways or on cliffs overlooking the ocean. He'd heard about Summit. Word had gotten around after Utah and a couple of follow-up events. Thing is, he told the founders, you're keeping it real when what you really need to do is keep it surreal. It was kind of his way of saying that Summit was a bit boring, that it needed to go up a gear or two. And he was right. That brings us to the second factor. Atmosphere. The staging, the environment, the table by the side of the highway that reframes your dish of tortellini. The thing that makes the event, well, surreal, memorable, immersive. So what if you hired an entire cruise ship, packed it with over a thousand interesting guests, and sailed it around the Bahamas for three days? In 2011, Summit did exactly that. Suddenly, everything came together. It was a unique experience with amazing people. Think back to those stuffy, overlit hotel lobbies and then imagine the exact opposite. That's what Summit at Sea was. There were meals cooked by young chefs, live music on multiple decks, intimate corners with sheepskin rugs for conversations, Meditation sessions, conferences on everything from cryptocurrency to conflict resolution. Bars, pools, DJs. It was impossible to feel bored. And after 2011, Summit never looked back. Events became larger, more extravagant, and even more surreal. It's a recipe that works. Tens of thousands of people have attended their events. More importantly, They've built lasting relationships. Let's get into just a couple of examples. Quickie, an iPhone video sharing app that was sold to Yahoo for $50 million, was born at a summit event. The $100 million wristwatch health tracker company, Basis, secured its first round of major investment at another event. Great things happen when you bring the right people together and get them talking in the right environment. So, Summit may have started with one great groundbreaking idea, but how can a company stand the test of time and stay innovative? Summit's answer is that you foster a culture in which no idea goes unspoken. Let's break that down. Ideas are egalitarian. Interns can have great ideas, and CEOs can have terrible ideas. It can go the other way, too, of course. Sometimes relative inexperience and experience do matter. The point is, a great idea can come from anywhere, and the status of the person proposing it isn't a reliable indicator of its worth. So that's the first marker of a culture that's open to ideas. Everyone gets a fair hearing. The second marker is that there's an emphasis on generating lots of ideas. It's not just that anyone can put forward an idea. It's that there's an expectation that everyone will. That's because quantity makes quality. It's only by getting it all out there that you get to the good stuff. If an idea isn't right, you move on. No harm, no foul. You don't have to commit to a bad idea just because you've given it a hearing. But the more bad ideas you hear the more likely you are to find the good ones. On one level, hiring an entire cruise ship for more than a million dollars was a crazy idea. But it's what put Summit over the top. And that's where that culture makes a difference. When you're willing to engage with crazy-sounding ideas, you often find out that they're actually workable. Let's talk about another wild idea. Getting Jeff Bezos to appear at a Summit event without blowing the company's entire annual budget on speaking fees. Honestly, that just doesn't really sound doable. After all, this is one of the world's richest and most in-demand men. But okay, sure, let's give the idea a fair hearing. What is a speaking fee anyway? Well, it's a benefit, a remuneration for someone's time and energy. But does it have to take the form of money? The more they thought about it, the less sure Summit's founders were that it did. Elliot, for example, remembered a deal he'd struck with a limousine service years earlier. The company wanted to place ads in his newsletter, 
but they couldn't afford to, so they came to a different arrangement. They got the ads, and Elliot got to use their limousines to drive to meetings. And there'd been similar deals with bands who'd performed at events, too. But what can you offer a man who has it all? The answer was a platform. This was 2016. Bezos had become a household name, but people didn't really know his story. Who was he? Where did he come from? What were his values? That's what Summit offered him. A chance to tell that story to a live audience of 2,500 people, as well as the millions who'd later watch a recording of that interview. That, to him, was a unique benefit that was far, far more valuable than a speaker's fee. The moral of that story is make those big plans and give the crazy ideas a hearing. You never really know. They might just work out. So that's it for the Blink to Make No Small Plans by Elliot Bisno, Jeff Rosenthal, Jeremy Schwartz, and Brett Lev. What is it, if nothing else, that you should remember from this today? Summit's philosophy is that interesting things happen when interesting people get together in the right way and start talking. And that's really at the heart of what the company does. It provides a forum for people to collaborate on big plans. And it's also how Summit itself works. It's the founder's commitment to nurturing ideas, creative problem solving, and above all, collaboration that's made Summit so successful. So if you're feeling a bit uninspired or at a dead end, consider going to a conference, finding or founding a group of people interested in trading ideas, and seek out those ways and places that you can open your mind to new ways of thinking. And if you enjoyed this Blink, be sure to leave us a rating and some feedback. We really do love it when you share your thoughts. 